Thank you for joining us uh, for this Tuesday, October 11th, uh, How Time Flies By. The first thing I'd like to do today is I want to thank Faith for hosting the last three weeks. Um, I've been out on vacation and some other meetings, and I appreciate Faith stepping in and hosting those for us. Um, for my vacation, if you can look at my background picture and you can identify where that is at, you'll know where I went on vacation. Um, you can go ahead and post that in the chat, and we'll see if uh, anybody can figure out uh, where those arches are from. But uh, it was a bucket list trip that I've been trying to take for over 30 years, so finally got to do it. So with that, we are going to jump into today's session. Um, as we'd like to do, we'd like to start by uh, recognizing all of our community partners. Uh, we cannot do these boot camp sessions without them, their time, their effort, and their expertise. So for those new, the Small Business Boot Camp is a program we set up designed to help businesses plan and grow and, and be successful, uh, looking for small businesses and, and very small businesses that are categorized. It is a statewide initiative supported by all of our community partners. And not only is it our webinar that we do every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m., it is a content library and a series of workshops with our community partners. So we'll talk about those here in a bit. The uh, AC has some great programs to help support small businesses. One is the Small Business Content Library. Um, and this is a result of the Small Business Bootcamp. We've recorded all of our sessions uh, since the beginning. And this content library now has over 200 is closer to probably 250 recorded webinars and presentations that you can access at any time um, and watch the video, download the materials that the presenter provided um, and review those, you know, at your, when is best for you. So it's a great resource. You can find it at the bottom of our bootcamp website, webpage. Uh, if you just scroll down uh, past the current top, uh, sessions, you'll find the content library. Additionally, our ACA has a number of programs to support small businesses, our small business services, our workforce division, and our Arizona MEP, our Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Um, besides these programs, we have our small business checklist, and this is an online interactive tool to help small businesses that are looking to get started or looking to grow into new areas uh, to understand the commonly requested licensing, registration, and compliance needs and requirements requirements at the local, state, and federal levels. So with that, let's jump in and look at some of the upcoming sessions we have. Um, we have our Getting Business Capital, Pre Prepare, Adapt, and Overcome. We are going to have representatives from the Small Business Administration uh, with us to talk about their programs and how you can leverage the SBA programs. And then on Tuesday, the 25th, uh, we're going to have a webinar focused on Instagram marketing. And then also on November 2nd, we have our final workshop of the year. Uh, it is a Grow Your Business, Access to Capital and Other Resources with a big focus on year ending. Um, things you need to do and actions you need to take as you end the year, as, especially if you're looking to access funding in 2023. So it's gonna be a great session. We hope you can make it. We wanna focus on the in-person. There will be a Zoom component uh, if you can't make it in-person, but there are some benefits to attending in-person that you can find out on the website that when you look at that in the description, you'll see there's some little perks offered by some of our partners there. So before we jump into the next slide, I wanna just check the chat and see if uh, anybody Got it, and it uh, looks like the first person to get it was Clinton. Um, he said, looks like you went to the Moss Cathedral of Cordoba for vacation. Yes, those columns behind me are part of the Mesquita, which is a mosque cathedral in Cordoba that dates all the way back to when the uh, Islamic rule went from the Middle East all the way to the peninsula, the Iberian Peninsula. Um, it's an amazing place, so we're excited to go there and visit. So with that, we're going to jump into today's session. We're going to introduce our speaker. We have Harry Brzezaski. 
Uh, she's a fractional CEO and employee retention and burnout expert. And she's been with us before and it was such an awesome presentation that we needed her to come back, especially as we are closely and quickly coming into the holiday season where lots of people get stressed out with work and family and other things. And so it's a great opportunity to have her back uh, and not just the holiday season, but you know, if you watch the news or listen to the news, there's a lot going on right now to stress out just about everybody uh, with elections and economy and other stuff. So we are excited to have Carrie with us. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and Carrie, I'm gonna turn the time over to you. All right, well, thank you so much. I'm happy to uh, be here and uh, share a few tips on how not only you as business owners, but how you and your team um, can reduce stress and burnout. Because as uh, Robert said, it's getting, uh, it hasn't gotten any better and the levels of stress over the last couple of years coming out of the pandemic and then going back, whether we have remote, hybrid, um, everybody in the office, everybody out of the office, it's just added a new level of stress. Um, and the higher the stress, the lower the engagement, the lower the engagement, the higher your turnover. So it really is impacting small businesses. So um, I'm excited to be able to share a little bit with you today. Now, can you see my you, my screen okay? Yes. Okay, good. perfect. So what I'm going to share with you today is really kind of the current state. Um, we all know it's very stressful. But the big thing is the overlooked signs of stress and burnout that you might be able to either see in yourself or your teammates so that you can address it a little bit earlier. Also talk about some strategies of how you can actually reduce your risk of burnout anxiety and stress. They, I put those all together because it very, really depends on the definition that you use of burnout and stress as to kind of where you are, but they all go together. Um, and unrelenting stress leads to burnout. Unrelenting anxiety and stress leads to burnout. Again, it makes a difference for you in your organizations. Um, you know, the smaller you are, I always say the smaller you are, the harder it is when you lose somebody. You know, I've been in corporate healthcare before opening my own uh, consulting business and, you know, 20 people, one is gone, 19 can pick up the pick up the slack. But when you're 3, 10, you lose one or two, that's a huge chunk of your workforce that is gone. Or you can't do it because you are stressed and burnout. So we'll talk about that. So how you can um, reduce the stress and then also actually go through a couple techniques. It's very easy. Um, you know, we can go more in depth if you want, but today I just wanted to kind of give you some quick, easy things that you and your team can do as well as how to create that division of leaving work at work and being able to go home and really be able to engage with your family so that it's not constantly bleeding over. So as we talked about, what exactly is stress and burnout? So stress is, we've all felt it. There's good stress, there's bad stress. You know, I'm getting married, um, my kid graduated from whichever grade or high school or college. That's exciting, but it's also stressful. So any of that stress, doesn't matter whether it's good or bad, it causes stress in the body. And we talk about stress and burnout. Burnout is actually a work-related phenomenon. It, it's actually that unrelenting stress and it leads to a, a whole host of objectives. And burnout, like we use it outside of work, but it's really a workplace um, uh, condition. And it's that feeling of depletion, you're exhausted, you become mentally disengaged, you can become very negative, you become cynical, and it may even be like just one aspect of what you do. Um, you see it a lot in people who have to work with the public. You know, they just get to the point where they dread that face-to-face -face that connection, even though they used to love it. It doesn't mean that like you're bad at your job. It just means you've had kind of enough and you don't have the reserves or you've used up all the reserves and now you just are completely de depleted. And a lot of times that leads to feeling 
um, guilty. You feel guilty because like if you're the business owner, you love your business, but you're almost at the point where you're ready to hand over the keys. I mean, that's what one client recently said. You know, I'm just at the point where I'm ready to hand over the keys to my business. I don't want to do it anymore. And so there are things that we can do to help reduce that. You have team members that are feeling that way. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, before we get started kind of going through this, I'd love for you to just kind of jot down what is your current level of stress on a one to 10, 10 being you can't put one more thing on my plate or you ask me to do one more thing and I'm going to lose it. I'm going to be in tears or I just can't do it. And one being like, this is the best gig I've ever had in my life. I love what I do. I love my family. I feel like I'm balanced. Um, I get to do and make the choices that I want. Just kind of jot it down. You can even put it in the chat. Um, but really, it's for you to kind of where are you currently? So I'll give you just a second to kind of do that. And while you just put that down, I want you to realize why does this even matter? Why are we talking about it? Kind of alluded to it earlier. The cost of stress, burnout, and anxiety really hits the bottom line of small businesses. It hits all businesses. But 50% of turnover, which we know is very costly, a minimum wage employee, they're now saying is at the very lowest is costing an organization $1,500. Typically, they say at least $3,500 is what the loss of that employee actually costs small businesses because of the lost productivity, the overtime of others, and the cost of finding a new one. So at minimum $3,500, when you are trying to replace your management positions, it can be anywhere from six to nine months worth of their salary that it costs you as a small business. Think about that's a big chunk of money. And I don't bet any of you plan like, oh, this is how much money we're going to lose this year because we're going to have turnover. You're trying to create a culture and build into your team so that you don't have that. The other thing is 50% of absenteeism is related to stress because they get your, your teammates get stressed out. And so you've got lost productivity or you've got to replace it um, with somebody else or you don't, you know, I had one small business this summer that lost a key employee and it literally, in the amount of business that they could take on, took a $27,000 hit for a small business in a month. One month, one employee gone. So it really does um, affect our bottom lines. The other is that 75% of all doctor visits, just so you know, so I came from healthcare. I've been a nurse for 30 years before I went into consulting. And I can tell you the majority of illness over and over and over again is because of stress. So if you are fortunate enough to be able to offer healthcare benefits, you really, each year it's based on typically um, when they go to actuarial, you know, how sick are your people? How much are they already utilizing healthcare? Or maybe you're self-funded and that's coming directly out of your pocket. The more that you can reduce the stress of yourself, your employees, the lower your healthcare costs can be. So it, it really does hit your bottom line and make a difference there. So what are the symptoms? We know it's important. It hits our bottom line. It hits more our, um, our uh, not more, um, our motivation, um, our overall culture. But what are those symptoms? So many times we just kind of blow it off because, oh, I've got a headache. Oh, he's got high blood pressure. I've got heart conditions, diabetes, skin. Like who thinks that their skin, but when you think about it, when you get hives, typically you either got into something that caused you the hive or you got really, really stressed and people get hives. Arthritis, asthma, depression, obesity, all of those symptoms, we just kind of put as part of aging or it's just, you know, I got a headache, I'll take some Advil and go about it. But a lot of times it's stress. And so if we can do things to lower our stress individually and with our teams, a lot of those things will go away. The other is if you are, you have chronic disease, Stress contributes to the top six causes of chronic disease in the United States. 
heart disease, cancer, lung ailments, meaning asthma, COPD, um, uh, pulmonary dysfunction, accidents, and suicide. I think accidents and suicide actually are probably a little bit more linked. Now, we have the whole fentanyl and, and poisoning that where people are, our young people are dying at a higher rate than they've ever died before. Um, but I also believe that a lot of accidents are because people are stressed and sometimes it's an on my opinion, and we've seen it in healthcare, is that it's an, it's a suicide attempt. It's easier to smash my car um, into a tree, drive off into a ravine and be done with it than let's say, you know, some other type of suicide. So I think sometimes accidents that happen are actually a portion of suicide. But the other is we know that the higher we're stressed, the more apt we're matter to make mistakes. So if you have a business where people are doing big machinery or, um, you know, things that really matter, you're part of manufacturing, the higher the stress, the more apt you are to make a mistake. In healthcare, we said it all the time, the higher the stress, the more apt you are to make a mistake. In those environments, it could mean somebody's life, not just the individual with chronic illness. Cost the, the US about $190 billion a year. And again, 75% of all those doctor visits are because of stress. So you may be thinking, okay, I'm stressed, but I'm, I'm unique. Unfortunately, you're not alone. You are not alone. 47% of the workforce in the U.S., and this was across all industries, and this is actually statistics that came out last week by a study that Microsoft did. 47% of workers are burnt out. So if you're burnt out, it means we have an even higher level that are feeling the stress. And 53% of managers, a lot of times we focus, if you have a team where you've got a lead or it's you that's kind of in that role of the manager, we don't have a lot of support. We want them to support our teams, but we've also got to remember that that management level, those people leading other people, they're burning out too, and so they need our help too. So I want to share a couple strategies to reduce the risk. Now, there are a whole gamut of different things that you can do, but the I'm gonna share with you the four things that I think are number one, the easiest to implement, doesn't require any major skill, and anybody can do it, and they're things you can start today. So we're gonna go over those, but before we do, I really wanna talk about what actually is burnout. I We talked kind of it's that unrelenting stress, but I look at burnout as having three legs. So kind of like the stool on the slide. Each leg can, you know, if one goes short, it's gonna make your, your um, stool out of balance. You've got you as the individual. Now, there are a lot of techniques and a lot of programs that just focus on you as the individual. The things that you do personally, how you do it, and where I'm gonna share some things that you can do actually today but the other leg of, of burnout is the environment that you create in the workforce. What do you allow? What do you tolerate? What do you promote? Um, how, uh, how is stress and burnout addressing that? Most people say they leave jobs. It's still up there because one, they don't feel like it's a good mix. Like, I'm not doing worthwhile work. People wanna make a difference. And so sometimes you have to help them as a leader or as the owner of a business to understand how what they do goes into your overall mission. And one of the big things that I like to share with people is, you know, as business owners, we all kind of have our, our elevator pitch. You know, it's like, what do you do? I can rattle it off in just a couple um, sentences so people know what I do. Do your employees do that? I encourage everybody to give each individual on their team their own elevator pitch. Just like I have a friend who's a CFO. What, and he's like, ah, I'm CFO, I manage the money. But what if he said, I'm a CFO for a small business and you know what? I get to make sure that we manage our money so that when we wanna grow and we wanna invest more in our local community, we have the funds to do that. I get to make sure that we have the funds to pay our people well. Very different than I manage the money. Just like a 
Um, I hear it all the time, receptionist. Um, I'm just the receptionist. Well, what if your person, whoever answers the phone, is able to say, you know what? Uh, your your company wants to provide amazing customer service for you know your customers and your receptionist is able to say you know what at my organization I'm the first touch I get to create that wow experience from the first phone call and hand it throughout the organization very different than I answer phones at ABC organization so tie them in so that they feel feel and know that their position is valued because if you're a business owner a manager you wouldn't have them on the team if you didn't need them because you would be doing it yourself or it wouldn't be done so everybody is integral but it's how do you create that environment to where they feel valued and then the other is the organizational culture what kind of culture are you building as i say culture will eat strategy every day for for lunch and it needs to be that your culture matters and that you're living your culture. And see, sometimes we have people who are like, here's my mission and this is what I want. But then when you look at the way in which they operate, they absolutely don't jive. You'll hear it where people are like, yeah, we're supposed to be all about X, Y, Z, but we don't even do it in our own company. And so look at that because you have opportunities where you can make some difference because it's that three-legged stool. You got to have all three of them to avoid burnout and create a great culture within your organization. So I want to start with what can you do for you and you can encourage your, your teammates to do it as well. And it's actually self-care. When you go on an, am or an ambulance, when you're in an airplane and you've ever flown, they always tell you if the, if the cabin loses pressure, the oxygen's going to come down. You need to put it on yourself first and then help others. Your team, take note from what you do. If you're the leader, if you aren't putting your own oxygen mask on, number one, your team won't think that it's important. And number two, they don't think that it's valued. So the things that you do actually do matter to your team. So if you want to have a low stress, engaged environment, you need to model these things for your teammates so that they can see it. And it all starts with you got to put that oxygen mask on first and be able to take care of you. The top three things that I think that you can do very easily now. I say they're easy to do, sometimes they're hard to implement. It's sleep, stillness, or a mindfulness practice, and we'll go over both of those. Learning to say no, and recently I've added a fourth, and it's take back lunch, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. So what we wanna do is sleep. I, it, it's, if any of you have had kids, you've been around moms who have little ones, you know that bedtime, and naps, like they will move heaven and earth. They will move a play date. They will move going to the zoo around a nap and bedtime because they know that if they don't, their children are not the most well-behaved. They're cantankerous. They are sometimes even a little uncomfortable to be around. Well, I'm telling you, adults were no different. Sleep is imperative to overall health and to reducing stress. The CDC says that we need seven to nine hours of sleep a night. Now, there are a few of you that are like, ah, I only need four hours of sleep. You're the, you know, the unicorn out there. I'm married to one and his mother is the same way. I am not. For the most part, seven to nine hours of sleep. You've got to make sleep a priority. Stop leaving sleep for that thing that goes at the end of the day, whenever everything else is done, then I will sleep. If you start making sleep a priority, the things at the end of the day will actually start to get less because you'll have the energy and the wherewithal to be able to do it. So you wanna have a consistent bedtime, get into a, a daily routine, get outside. The more you can be outside, I encourage everybody to be out, outside at least for 20, 30 minutes a day. We live in Arizona for sakes. So there's really very few days in our state where you can't be outside for 20 to 30 minutes. 
Even in the heat of the summer, you can get out of the sun, but get outside. Ideally, if you can do it in the morning, it's even better because the sunshine in the morning actually hits the cones and the rods in the back of your eyes, increases melatonin, which is a hormone that we need to help us sleep. So you actually, you don't, and outside without sunglasses, it also improves your vitamin D with the more um, sunshine you can have directly on your skin, which also improves your health. So get outside, it really does make a difference. Um, limit your technology at night. You want to also watch your dietary intake. So you've got um, caffeine, you can add some resistant starches, which is kind of those things that in the nighttime will help keep you sleep, sleeping longer. An example of a resistant starch is um, a, a, a half a banana, so a quarter of a cup of beans. Adding those to your diet actually maintains your blood sugar throughout the night. A lot of times we wake up at night because our blood sugar spikes, our cortisol, which is a hormone, as our stress hormone, actually increases to bring the glucose down and be able to set it out. And then we have low cortisol in the morning when we're actually supposed to be waking up because we were awake at 2 a.m. And so we get our whole sleep cycles um, out of whack. So your diet really does impact your sleep. I actually have a handout. Um, I'll share it at the end if you want it, this kind of all written out so that you have it. Um, but make sleep a priority. Kind of treat sleep like moms did when we were little kids and get to bed at a routine time and it really will make a difference. The other thing that I talked about was having a stillness or a mindfulness practice. There's a bunch of different things that you can do. This is not an exhaustive list by any stretch, but it's creating white space, calm, being able to just have a few minutes where you ground yourself, keep yourself still. It really will make a difference. I found that when I work with clients, if I say, just, I just want you to sit quiet for five minutes, you know, and they're like, well, can I have some music? Do you want, no, I don't want you to have anything. I want you to literally just sit still for five minutes. If you are one of those people that you would rather gnaw your right arm off than to try to sit quietly for five minutes, that is an indicator that you are super stressed and that you've got to teach your body how to calm down. The other thing that I didn't share about sleep is it's when your body rejuvenates itself. And you can get those little benefits when you do a mindfulness stillness practice. And so it's really calming yourself down. Most of us live in fight or flight where we're constantly going, going, going. Ancestrally, we were in, you know, we everything was see it. Is it friend? Is it foe? Do we need to run? Do we need to hide? What do we need? Well, our body doesn't know, we have this amygdala in our brain, it doesn't know the difference in stress from when we were running from ancestral tigers to what we do now. And so if we can kind of calm it down so that it's not feeling like we're constantly running in this like over keyed up state, it really does help us rejuvenate. So try some meditation, some breathing, grounding, Forest bathing is probably my favorite. Uh, we live in the desert, it's not quite as foresty, but you know, go out in the desert, look at nature. It really does make a difference and can really help calm your stress down. 10 minutes a day, um, research found being outside can make a difference in your overall stress level. A year from now even, they said. So this study looked at a group of people over a six month period, they still had benefits one year out when they incorporated 10 to 20 minutes of outside time each day. So we already know, we talked about outside helps improve your sleep. This helps decrease your stress. If you can't get outside, even looking at trees, looking at an ocean will actually help decrease your overall stress. Um, and the other that I love this because we're getting ready to go into the holiday season, it's learning to say no. And so many of us, that's a really hard thing to do. We think it's expected of us. We think our um, teammates are counting on us. But when you say yes to everything, you take the opportunity away from somebody else to step up. So stop feeling guilty 
and start saying no. It's okay. You think about it. No is probably one of the very first words that we learn as children. No, I don't want that. No, 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 no. I mean, everybody knows a one and a half, two year old where no, 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 it comes out of their mouth all the time. So we know how to say it. I don't know why as adults, we forget to say it. And sometimes it's really uncomfortable. And so what I've learned, I even do this with my own son. He'll ask me something. It's really something either he needs to do or I don't want to do. And I say, no, but thank you for asking. It derails immediately the response that we think we're going to get where they're going to argue with us. No, but thank you for asking. The other thing is to ask yourself, is it a priority? And in business, if you are a leader, you are the owner, you need to start asking yourself, is it a priority? Because if it's not a priority, it might be something that you want to do in Q1 of 2023. It doesn't need to be done right now. You know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Your business isn't going to be built in a day. And so you need to focus on what's a priority now. So many times when I talk to leaders and team members in small businesses, they're trying to do everything right now. And you need to kind of plan it out. You've got some time. Yes, we want to be, you know, first to the market. You want to, you know, be up on trends. But are you doing it at the expense of you, your team, and your business? So look at, is it a priority? Is it a priority now? Because, and, and the other thing that you could say when somebody asks about it, it's like, that is a great idea. It's not a priority for our business right now. We can put it over here and create a parking lot list um, and, and those things that you can come back to later. And then even in your personal lives, learn to say no. You know, we have this whole FOMO, fear of missing out. Mm, as I get older, I'm like, that is so not a thing for me. I got the fear of having to do. <laughs> and so being able to say no and being comfortable with it, because number one, either it's not a priority in my life or my family is a priority. So I'm going to say no to this because this other thing is more important or I need to make time for it. So be okay saying no, because that's where you create the boundaries for you and you know what you want to do. So ask yourself, is it a priority? Be okay saying no, but thanks for asking. And it will do a whole lot. The other is be okay to hear no too. Be like, okay, she said no, now I'm gonna go ask somebody else. The other is like I said, when you have a team and let's say Mary's always your go-to and you always ask Mary everything, but that time that Mary said, I can't, I can't put anything on, no, I cannot do it. And then you go over and you ask George and George is able to do it. George had never been able to shine that way. Wasn't that he didn't have the skills. You just never allowed him to step up into it. So when we say no, we allow somebody else to be able to shine as well. So no is not always that like negative thing that we always think it is. So now what I want to do is I want to spend a couple of minutes and walk you through a couple of techniques that you can actually do. Let's talk about stillness. I spent a little bit of time earlier. And then I'm gonna walk you through three actual breathing techniques. I have some uh, clients that they actually will pick one of these breathing techniques as they're kind of implementing it in their organization. They do it before their staff meetings. They come together, they do a moment where they really think about, um, everybody goes around what's positive, what's working. They take some deep breaths in, and then they start the meeting. And it's amazing how it actually can get you into a whole different mindset. Because one of the amazing things is our brain is there to keep us safe. Like I said earlier, we've got that amygdala in there. It's looking at everything. Is it friend, foe, keep you safe? It's looking friend, foe, keep you safe. And so we're cycling through that all the time. When we take the time to be still, to take some breaths, the brain can't do it. It can only do one thing at a time. And I know people will say I'm a great multitasker. I, I, uh, I differ with you. Chances are you're really good at being able to manage multiple things, but you're not getting a lot of things done. And research after research after research shows us if we do one thing, get it done, go to the next, we're much more productive. We have better outcomes and all of that. But that being said, 
there are times where you can just stop the stress cycle and you don't know what your employees, your teammates, even the, the boss brings to work each day. We all have lives outside of what we do, you know, in the confines of business. So sometimes taking to where you have built in the practices into routine meetings and routine things that you do throughout the day actually helps other people, not just you. So we're going to walk through that and then how to create um, some boundaries so that when you go home, you can leave work at work. So the first one that I'm going to share with you is called box breathing technique. And it's just what it sounds like. You're going to kind of breathe like you're a box. You're going to inhale for a count of four. You hold the breath for a count of four. You exhale for a count of four. And then you hold for a count of four. So just take a nice inhale. Inhale for four. One, two, three, four. Hold two, three, four. Blow it out. Two, three, four. Hold two, three, four. It doesn't matter how long the hold is, how long the exhale. It's just that rhythmic breathing. Again, your brain can't do multiple things at once, so it's going to focus on the breathing. You're going to inhale for four, so hold four, exhale four, hold four. And you just repeat this around four or five um, times. If you're a parent, teach this to your kids when they start to get really anxious. Um, or, you know, you start to feel the anxiety coming on, share it with them. It's like, you know what? This is getting to be really stressful. I need to just take a moment and I'm going to breathe. Let's just inhale for four, hold for four, exhale for four, and then hold for four. And you just go round and round as many times as you need. And most people, when they do it, they'll actually feel the anxiety or the stress, or it'll be like, I feel tingles at the end of my fingers. That's just you calming yourself down instead of being whirled into whatever's going on at the moment. It brings you back to the present. It grounds you in the here and the now instead of swirling. So box breathing, in four, hold four, exhale four, hold four. The next one, is my favorite. We've all done it where you hear people, you know, they just take a breath, take a breath, take a breath because our body knows what we need and it's deep breathing. What I'd like you to do is I want you to just like kind of note the stress that you feel in your body. Take a big deep breath in just literally as big as you can, hold it and then blow it out as long as you can just and then do it one more time. Big deep breath in, hold it, and then blow it out as long as you can. Some of you that may have been very stressed may have felt like your shoulders were your earrings. I always say I love my earrings, but my shoulders don't need to be there. You'll feel your shoulders actually come down. Just do it again. Just big breath in, let it out. And you can then feel your body. You can feel your shoulders. Everything calms down. The goal of deep breathing is to make your exhalation longer than your inhalation. So you breathe in, but you're going to blow out longer. What that does physiologically in your body actually takes you from that parasympathetic nervous system or your sympathetic nervous system which is your fight or flight and it actually kicks you over into parasympathetic parasympathetic is where your digestion works your creativity works you're able to um, do more creative long-term thinking because your body isn't thinking i gotta run from a tiger even though we don't have the tiger running after us anymore the brain doesn't know the difference. So when you're able to do that deep breathing, even the box breathing, it pulls you out of fight or flight. So many of us in our society live in fight or flight. I know I, I was a healthcare junkie and like we thrived on, I used to call it controlled chaos. But over time that takes its toll on our bodies. It takes its toll on our spirit takes toll on its mind. So to being able to learn how to just do that deep breathing. The other thing that's really fun, I was cautious during COVID to share this, but it's actually blowing bubbles. And deep breathing, you go outside, um, away from people, 
And you blow bubbles because when you blow bubbles, like who doesn't have fun with bubbles? It makes you happy. You see them in the air um, and it makes you laugh. You can do it with your kids, but it, it's just literally makes you blow out longer than you inhale. It also creates some uh, expansion in our chest. There's all kinds of physiological things that go on when we do that deep breathing that actually makes us healthier. Any of you have ever been in the hospital, you had that little machine that you had to suck up the little balls um, afterwards, and most people think that they're blowing out. It's increasing our lung capacity because the more our lungs are open and they can take in air and then blow it out, the healthier you are, the less apt you are to get sick, the less apt that, you know, those lower lobes in our, in our lungs don't move, and that's where we get... Um, where bacteria will hold and maybe you get an infection and all of that. So we want our lungs healthy and this really does help it. And then the next um, breathing technique that I'm going to share with you is called 478 breathing. This takes a little bit more time to kind of master in my opinion, but it is amazing. You can do 478 like if you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't get back to sleep, it's a great technique for that. Um, you are getting ready to do a presentation and you're really nervous or you got to ask somebody for something and you're a little nervous about what they're going to say and, and how they're going to respond. Um, or you just want to de-stress. So 478 is you inhale for a count of four, you hold it for a count of seven, you exhale for a count of eight. Again, we're getting the exhalation that's higher than the inhalation. And when you when you blow out and add it is if you can put your tongue right behind your teeth, there's a little pressure point right there um, that actually helps. So you're going to take a breath in for four, hold for seven, blow out for eight. And you do that three or four times and you will be amazed at how much more relaxed you can be. In four, hold seven, out eight. Now, some people will say, I can't hold my breath that long. You, count faster. It doesn't matter. It's you doing it for you. Um, if you're doing it as a team, you know, you might have, you know, you just have to let people know. If you can't hold your breath that long, you know, you just speed it up. It's your cadence that you go through, and it really helps reduce the stress. And again, get you out of fight and flight and get you over into rest and relaxation. Now, the last um, actual technique or is to actually have a process for leaving work at the end of the day. When we leave work, um, so many times we're carrying it with us and we have, you know, these cell phones and now we're so connected. Really look at being able to disconnect at the end of the day. Like there might be some times where you actually need to be available after hours, but for the most part, we need to set boundaries. So they have a work life and we have a home life. And, you know, we talk about work-life balance. It's not an even scale. I look at it as there's times where it goes back and forth. It's kind of like that scale that you, you used to see where they put a weight on one end and it goes back and forth. I don't think work-life balance makes everything balance equal. It means you're trying to balance and keep everything floating so that one thing isn't always high and the other one isn't always low. But to be able to do that, you have to communicate and you have to be able to have conversations with your team members about what the expectation is. Like if you don't expect people to be available after hours, don't send emails after hours. Set your emails to where they come in the morning. Um, really be able to, you know, create that culture where you've got that disconnect. If you work from home, it's even more important because you've got to figure out how to shut it down and walk into your life. Because I love my family. I love what I get to do as a quote unquote job. But the only reason I have a job or have ever had a job, if you really think about it, is because I need finances to sustain the, the lifestyle that I've become accustomed to. Because think of it, if it weren't like to be able to have our lifestyle, none of us would do this. We'd go volunteer, okay? It might give us some great um, worth and all of that, but overall, we do it because we want to become, you know, we want to have a life. 
Our job should not be our life. And so it's really creating that closure at the end of the day or end of whatever it is that you have so that you can be there, be present in your family. So the way that you do it is, I call it, it's a close the door technique. And you're gonna breathe, we've already talked about breathing. You have a moment of gratitude of what you've done well. You affirm it, you visualize, actually visualize the stress going off, you smile and you walk out the door. And so um, what that looks like is, if you have a door, a doorway, a time clock, whatever it is, you wanna stand there and you want to breathe four to 10 times deep breathing. Some days it's like it takes all 10. Um, but really, it's you're just going to kind of get yourself into that spot to where I'm ending here and I'm ready to go for the next phase of my life, the next phase of my day. And so then you think of two things you're grateful for. It could be that the day is over. It could be something amazing that you did. It could be being grateful for the team that you have. Whatever. Just think of two things that you're grateful for. And then you simply say, I did my best today or I smashed it, I did this. So you want to actually say something and then you visualize, you actually visualize yourself shedding the stress of the day. Um, I like to tell people who are kind of that hero syn syndrome, it's like a cape that the cape just holds all the stress and you're just kind of Superman it. You know, he went into the, the um, or that was underdog. Uh, if you're old enough for me, you'll remember underdog. He went into the, um, the phone booth, he got his cape. Well, it's kind of a reverse. You're going in there, you're shedding the cape, and now you're going to walk out. And when you walk out, you smile and you walk through the door, and now you're on to the next. It'll take some practice, but if you get into the point of that, it will make it easier each day. So end the practice of taking everything home with you at night. Create a boundary. Create like almost like a physical barrier that you have to walk through to where you get to the next um, step in your career and in your day. And it will really make a difference. And then the last one I said I was going to share with you, because I think it is so important, is to take back lunch. I see it over and over again, where we as a society have created busyness and overwork as a badge of courage. It's like my a badge of honor. I'm so busy, I've got this, I've got that, I can't do lunch, I gotta work through lunch. And then we play the martyr game because oh, I had to work through lunch. Research after research after research will tell us, has told us, that if we take a break in our day, we will be more productive. It seems counterintuitive to stop and do something else to be able to come back and be more productive in the afternoon. If you are the owner, you're the CEO, you're a leader, they need to see you taking lunch. I will admit I'm bad about it too. And I have made a concerted effort to make sure that when I'm on site with clients, when I am working with my own team, that they see me break for lunch. What's even better is that when you can eat together. And sometimes, you know, people want to have this separation between their employees and, and management and this. I think that's just hogwash. People want to be engaged. People want to work with good people. You are able, when you share a meal, you're able to talk about things unrelated to work. They say that, the re, that one of the downfalls of hybrid and work from home is this loss of eating together. And that eating together creates a bond so that when there is a crisis, people can come together and they feel more attached and more engaged with one another to be able to overcome an obstacle. If you're a small business, let your phones go to voicemail for 30 minutes. Put on there, you know, our office is closed for lunch. No one expects you to be available 24-7 unless you have a true 24-7 business. Most businesses can allow for 30 minutes so that people can eat lunch. So I say take back lunch. The other thing, if you can take lunch and go outside for a couple minutes, remember we talked about getting um, outside improves your mood, improves your sleep, 
It also improves your creativity and the people who do 10 minutes at lunch outside actually have even higher, I can't remember the exact statistic, but it was greater than 25% increase in creativity and productivity in the afternoon after they've been outside. Think about the days that you actually meet a friend for lunch and you actually get out of where you're building whatever, how wonderful when you come back in the afternoon. It feels successful. It feels productive. You've changed the environment. Do it every day. For you, your team, it'll make a difference. So I say take back lunch. So I'm going to close with, think about it right now. What are you going to do that you're going to implement immediately? As I shared, none of this is hard work. It's all very easy to, to do. Sometimes it's a little harder to implement. But knowing is not enough. We have to take action. So I'd like you to take just a moment and jot down, what are you going to do? What are you going to do in the next three days that you're going to implement from what we've chatted about so that you can decrease your stress, you can decrease your team's stress because reducing stress, reducing burnout makes a difference for small businesses. So with that, I will... um, Share if you have any questions. You can reach out to me at redwoodexecutivecoaching.com. You can send an email there. Connect with me over on LinkedIn. I don't have a name that's hard to find. (laughs) Um, So um, I'd love to uh, connect and see if I can help you in any other way. So with that, I will turn it back over to you, Robert, unless we have any questions. Um, No questions yet, but if you have questions, please post them in the Q&A. Great presentation. I, I was thinking of what I can do. I'm going to work on some breathing techniques and I'm going to try to take back my lunch because I have found that when I work remote, I end up working through lunch a lot of times. Um, and even at the office, uh, I'll work through lunch at times. And I had a best practice uh, in a prior role in my career. I worked in big box retail. Um, and if any of you worked in big box retail, you know it can be highly stressful. and for not short days, for very long days. And I had a best practice. I would, on my lunch, I'd take my lunch, usually an hour, and I'd just go outside, sit in my car, eat lunch, listen to radio or read a book, uh, something to give my mind a complete break uh, from the ongoings in the store. And then after lunch, return and go back out until the uh, day was done. Yeah. Well, I have one client that actually implemented in their time clock an automatic 30 minute um, reduction, you know, automatically takes out 30 minutes for lunch. It's amazing. The team all now takes lunch because and before it was like it, they'd clock out, they'd one clock out, whatever. And it, it wasn't about the time. It was I'm going to force people to have to tell me that they didn't take lunch so that I can put the time back in. And people were like, it's already coming out. I better go take my lunch. So it's just a paradigm shift. It didn't change um, that, you know, we want people to clock out for 30 minutes, take their lunch, whether it's paid or unpaid. But when you kind of incorporate it in and people feel like if I don't take it, I'm missing out, it encouraged them to do it. And now they're happier and they're like, oh my gosh, I wish I would have done this before. Excellent. Well, we don't have any questions, so with that, we will wrap up and give everybody about six minutes back to their day. Uh, we really want to encourage you to take those notes that you made today and your commitments to, to practice those and implement those in your business and reduce your stress going forward. Um, so again, thank you, Carrie, for this great presentation. Uh, thank you to everybody for attending. We appreciate you being here with us, and we look forward to seeing you next Tuesday, 9 a.m., And we hope some of you can also make it to our workshop on November 2nd. So with that, we will wrap up. Again, have a great day, great week, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks so much.